Well, what I've, what I've found as I have studied more and more um, about feminist claims is that every single feminist claim is false. And, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it simply never has been the case that there was any kind of desire on the part of male scholars or anybody else in society to exclude half of humanity from the historical record or from mythology or religion or the stories we tell about ourselves or, or anything. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely nonsense. One of the most common flaws among anti-feminists, MRAs, and feminist critical self-hating women is their constant whinging and moaning about allegedly fake feminist statistics, allegedly exaggerated feminist claims, and the alleged existence in the historical context of a thing that they sneeringly describe as a two-sided coin. Feminists engage in revisionist history, these misogynists say. Feminists do fake news, these bigots say. And of course, we all know that in the minds of gender traitors like our next speaker, all of this critique and disagreement is part of a conspiracy to roll back the progress of women, reinstitute the undeniable patriarchal oppression of women over centuries and today, and to deny modern women's lived experience of what it was like when they were battered women seeking a divorce from the Catholic Church in mid-14th century Italy. <laughs> Perhaps the worst thing I can say about this woman is that she is abusing her position as a privileged tenured pr professor to wrongly assert that women don't have it so bad. So I'm just going to give her to you, ladies and gentlemen, Janice Fiamengo. Phew, what a loony. Phew, what a loony. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all the organizers of this conference, which is so wonderful. Thank you for inviting me, and but especially for putting on such a wonderful series of presentations. I, um, the title of my talk is actually not correct. I changed it at the last minute. I thought you, many of you have heard me speak about the colonization of academia by feminist ideologues and you know, what that has meant for students, both male and female, uh, over the last 30 years. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, something of a, um, a consequence of that, but uh, a broader and slightly different issue. And, and so the title of the talk is Why We Need male positive histories. When it comes to men and women, we all know what the past is supposed to have been like. There were sexually predatory, powerful, entitled men, and there were sexually repressed, brutalized, and powerless women. This belief about the past justifies or at least greatly reduces public concern about injustice toward men in the present. So even if you can get people to admit that an in, a specific injustice or a range of injustices exists against men, the response that you hear is often, well, but men have had all the power in the past and women have been absolutely powerless since the beginning of time. Now even a glance at works of literature and journalism show us that this view of history is completely false and my argument today is simply that it is very helpful to our cause to demonstrate and to know that modern feminism and gynocentrism are based not only on misrepresentations about the present but also on huge misrepresentations about the past. And this is a vast challenge to explore our history. The fact that we have allowed the academic study of history as well as all of popular culture to be overtaken by feminist ideologues makes our task 
of discovering and conveying the truth, both very difficult and urgent. Hey you! Yes you! Watching this video! Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again or for the very first time with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. Enjoy behind the scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never before seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. And I'm saying this not as a trained historian, alas. I'm saying it as someone whose own ignorance about the past was in fact reinforced and even augmented by my years as a PhD student of English literature. But when the scales of feminist bigotry had fallen from my eyes, it became obvious to me that there is a much different, richer, more complex, far more humane story to be told about our history than many of us know. And so I'm just gonna offer today a few examples, two from literature and one from journalism, to give a glimpse into what I'm talking about. Exactly 200 years ago, in 1819, George Gordon, Lord Byron, the most flamboyant and notorious of the English romantic poets, published the first part of a, of a comic epic poem called Don Juan now considered one of the greatest long poems in the English language. In the poem, he took a well-known literary figure, Don Juan, or Don Giovanni in Italian, and he created around that figure a story that he claimed was, quote, actually true and based on real life, his own and his friends. In the opening canto of this long poem, the 16-year-old hero, Juan, has his first love affair with Donna Julia, who was no blushing virgin, but was a wealthy woman in her mid-twenties, unhappily married to a much older man. And with exuberant mockery, though not entirely without sympathy, the narrator of the poem describes this mature woman's <coughs> seduction of the sexually innocent young man. The emphasis of this scene in a, matter with, in a manner with, I think, startling relevance to our own time, the emphasis is on female sexual duplicity. Julia is so convinced of her own virtue that she seems unaware of the reality of her actions. As the passage opens, she and the young man are sitting together and Julia is reassuring herself of the strength of her commitment to her marriage vows at the very same moment that she allows her hand to fall onto Juan's quite by mistake, the poem tells us, i.e. not by mistake at all. From this point on, it is only a matter of time before Julia and Juan consummate their passion. And what fascinates the narrator here is the vast discrepancy between what Julia told herself about her actions, what she probably believed, and what her actions unmistakably communicate to the young man. Even while telling herself that she would never betray her husband, she is betraying her husband. And the young man is clearly not the sexual aggressor in the scene, but the one seduced. Now, I've omitted a couple of the um, stanzas so as not to make this too long, but I want you to read this with me. So here it is. Julia had honor, virtue, truth, and love for Don Alfonso. And she inly swore by all the vows below to powers above, she never would disgrace 
the ring she wore, nor leave a wish which wisdom might reprove. And while she pondered this, besides much more, one hand on Juan's carelessly was thrown quite by mistake. She thought it was her own. Unconsciously, she leaned upon the other, the other hand of Juan, which played within the tangles of her hair and to contend with thoughts she could not smother she seemed by the distraction of her air. Twas surely very wrong in Juan's mother to leave together this imprudent pair, she who for many years had watched her son so. I'm very certain mine would not have done so. The hand which still held Juan's by degrees gently but palpably confirmed its grasp, as if it said, detain me if you please. Yet there is no doubt she only meant to clasp his fingers with a pure platonic squeeze. She would have shrunk as from a toad or asp had she imagined such a thing could rouse a feeling dangerous to a prudent spouse. I cannot know what Juan thought of this, but what he did is much what you would do. His young lip thanked it with a grateful kiss, and then abashed at its own joy, withdrew in deep despair, lest he had done amiss. Love is so very timid when tis new. She blushed and frowned not, but she strove to speak and held her tongue. Her voice was grown so weak. And Julia sate with Juan half embraced and half retiring from the glowing arm which trembled like the bosom where it was placed. Yet still, she must have thought there was no harm, or else twere easy to withdraw her waist. But then the situation had its charm. And then, God knows what next. I can't go on. I'm almost sorry that I e'er begun. And Julia's voice was lost except in sighs, until too late for useful conversation. The tears were gushing from her gentle eyes. I wish indeed they had not had occasion, but who, alas, can love and then be wise? Not that remorse did not oppose temptation. A little still she strove and much repented and whispering, I will ne'er consent, consented. <laughs> It's hard to believe that this was written nearly 200 years before that word consent, not to mention affirmative consent, became such a major plank of feminist activism and indeed of sexual assault law in Canada and I hope not but perhaps soon to be in the United States. One suspects unfortunately that in our time a properly trained judge or jury would find that the 16-year-old boy in this scenario had sexually assaulted the woman whose sexually inviting behavior would be considered nullified by her non-consenting words. The scene is remarkable, among other reasons, for showing us why the feminist mantra yes means yes and no means no is such a flawed standard for separating the licit from the illicit. And Byron knew this as well as we do, and yet we continue to pretend not to. We don't know to what extent Byron's comic portrait was intended to have wide sociological or personal import. We do know that Byron's own experiences as a child and boy may have led him to a heightened awareness of male sexual vulnerability as well as of the hypocrisy that surrounded ideas of feminine virtue. Byron had grown up without a father. His father had died or it's possible that he killed himself in France when Byron was very young. And he was raised by a violent and verbally abusive mother who harshly blamed and condemned her only child as his father's son. And we have the letters that the young Byron wrote about the deep distress that she caused him by what he called her, quote, violent paroxysms of rage, 
so dispro disproportionate to the cause. She told him, amongst other things, that he would become exactly like his father, a dissolute, cruel, irresponsible scoundrel. At times, she smothered him with affection. At other times, she burst out in verbal and physical fury, and Byron never knew which it would be. And as a result, he developed a terror of female emotional volatility. Compounding his mother's abusiveness between the ages of 9 and 11, Byron was emotionally and sexually molested by the family nursemaid, someone who biographers have described as a drunken, violent madwoman who took him to her bed to teach him about religion. The experience led him from an early age to define his identity self-destructively through transgressive affairs, sexual acting out um, with many sexual partners, both men and women, including a scandalous liaison with his half-sister that forced him to leave England altogether. To complicate matters further, he had been born with a crippled foot that was an early source of pain and shame, even as his precocious intelligence and his startling physical beauty led many admirers to pursue him sexually. And throughout his poetic career, Byron was preoccupied with a sense of being both unloved and unlovable, and of feeling like an exile from all that was good. So, so much for his male privilege. Almost a century later, a man named T.S. Eliot published his semi-autobiographical poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And this is a dramatic monologue by a man who feels himself paralyzed by fear of women's mockery and by his own insignificance as a sexual being. Originally titled, Proof Rock Among the Women, and with the character's name signifying both prudishness, prue, and emasculation, the reference to frock, the monologue seems to be addressing a potential lover with whom Proof Rock would like to force the moment, but with whom he cannot, cannot bring himself to say anything because he dares not disturb the universe. The entire poem is about his sense of failure as a man, his utter lack of entitlement. Throughout the poem, he imagines the comments that other people, particularly women, must be making about his various inadequacies, and he berates himself for imagining that he could ever provoke desire in a woman. Though he repeatedly reassures himself that there will be time, it's a repeated refrain, in telling himself this, he merely justifies his delay and ultimately concludes that time will bring nothing but a sterile repetition of his failure of nerve. There's an image of toast and tea in one of the parts I'm going to read to you, and there's other domestic references throughout the poem which emphasize the triviality of his concerns at one level, but the poem leaves us in no doubt about the genuineness of his deep self Dislike. So I'm reading just from uh, a little section of the poem, the middle of, of the poem. Whoops. Uh, this isn't the beginning. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. 
for I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways, and how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? Whoops, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. And should I then presume? The poem suggests that the speaker is captivated by the arms that are braceleted and white and bare and can't help but notice them. They're so alluring, he can't stop seeing them, yet he cannot act on his desire, for he is paralyzingly aware of the gaze of society, judging him and finding him wanting, mocking him, dissecting him. We might call this the female gaze. These are, as he describes them, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. In other words, he has felt the judgment of the world's women. He has felt their eyes on him, their contempt, their calculation, as he imagines it anyway, of his non-entity. His description of himself as, quote, sprawling on a pin, pinned and wiggling on the wall, refers to the practice of pinning insects for study, in insect specimens for study, suggesting that he feels similarly insignificant and similarly scrutinized examined without concern for his humanity or his need. This too is part of the record of male experience, this longing, this loneliness, this conviction of inadequacy. And there are countless male authored love poems in the history of the English language that express similar themes that explore male loneliness and male need and male desire and they are absolutely unintelligible to feminist approaches and they're of very little interest, in fact, to the majority of feminist critics who now dominate academia and the culture at large. So these are just two literary representations of maleness that form a tiny part of a large story that deserves to be told not to support a preformed gender ideology, unless it is an ideology, which I suppose it is, to believe that men have always been more than the privileged oppressors of women. The fact that we don't have this history at our fingertips weakens our agenda to oppose the present day dehumanization of men. Interestingly, one of the first tasks of feminism was to create woman-centered histories. And feminists even came up with a name for that kind of research, which they called herstory. And as a result of a concerted effort by feminists within academia and outside of academia, there is now a massive ongoing effort to learn about the lives of both ordinary and extraordinary women. It was long thought and declared that such wasn't necessary for men because we already know about kings and statesmen, we already know about male inventors and male explorers and such. But do we? How much do we know about these men's inner lives, about their experiences of themselves as men? What do we know about their relations with other men, with their understanding of their social role, with their conceptions of manhood? And what do we know about the experiences of men whose lives were not part of the public record? History, as an academic discipline, was traditionally the study of the great events that shaped societies, the, um, you know, the battles lost and won, international relations, that sort of thing. But out of the social ferment of the 1960s came an interest in a different kind of history, one that focused not on the epoch-making lives of the great, but on the everyday lives of the ordinary. 
Not coincidentally, though, this history was guided by an explicitly ideological commitment that had Marxist and feminist roots. It was called social history, and it turned its attention to the marginalized and the oppressed, telling their stories as acts of protest against a society that had not fully valued them. And much of what we now think we know about women and men in the past has filtered down to us from this kind of social history, which is presented as the history of women struggling against oppressive conditions that supposedly benefited all men. About the men, what we know tends to come to us through a feminist lens that is often spectacularly lacking in empathy and fairness. The magnitude of this task of creating male positive histories and all the forces arrayed against it are suggested in the third and final text that I want to mention briefly today. This is E. Belfort Bax's The Fraud of Feminism, which I know probably there are more people in this room um, who know about this text than if you had a general sampling of the, of the public. Published in 1913, this text was written by an English lawyer philosopher, socialist, and anti-feminist, not a conservative, a, a, a socialist, very sympathetic to Marxism, E. Belfort Bax, in his time a well-known commentator on issues of property and social class, now quite marginalized. He's of interest mainly to Marxist historians who are not interested at all, and in fact are embarrassed by his anti-feminism. Bax's book, is a fascinating corrective to those of us who tend to think, as I think many of us do, that men's problems mainly stem from second wave feminism or who imagine that at some point in the past feminism was a worthy movement innocent of anti-male animus. As Bax saw it, Feminism was, from the beginning, an irrational phenomenon that capitalized on female in-group solidarity and on man's inability to care for his fellow man. And Bax described the problems as follows, and it's amazing to think that this was 1913. He said, while modern feminism has succeeded in establishing a powerful sex solidarity amongst a large section of women as against men, there is not only no sex solidarity of men as against women, but on the contrary, the prevalence of an altogether opposed sentiment. In any conflict of interest between a man and a woman, male public opinion, often in defiance of the most obvious considerations of equity, sides with the woman and glories in doing so. So in Bax's calculation, the sex war that women had declared against men had already been won by women, 1913, for the simple reason that men were not willing to fight it, and in many cases were enthusiastic foot soldiers in the feminist cause. Bax confessed himself not quite certain why this was so, but he saw evidence of feminist bigotry supported by men everywhere. And this is what he said, whatever may be the explanation, and I confess I cannot find one completely satisfactory, the fact remains. A woman's movement, unassisted by man, still more if opposed energetically by the public opinion of a solid phal phalanx of the manhood of any country, could not possibly make any headway. As it is, we see the legislature, judges, juries, Parsons, especially those of the nonconformist persuasion, all vie with one another in denouncing the villainy and baseness of the male person and ever devising 
ways and means to make his life hard for him. To these are joined a host of literary men and journalists of varying degrees of reputation who contribute their quota to the stream of anti-manism in the shape of novels, storiettes, essays, and articles, and the design of which, or sorry, the design of which is to paint man as a base, contemptible creature, as at once a knave and an imbecile, a bird of prey and a sheep in wolf's clothing, and all as a foil to the glorious majesty of womanhood. And he then goes on in the book to explain, chronicling in great detail, the long-standing female legal privileges in his society, England at the turn of the, the 20th century, showing how in the areas of marriage rights, divorce, alimony, child custody, criminal prosecutions generally, capital punishment in particular, sexual assault law, infanticide, and many other specific areas of criminal law, men were legally as well as socially hugely disadvantaged. As a barrister with an intimate familiarity with legal cases and legal philosophy, he chronicled outrageous miscarriages of justice attributable to the sentimental conviction that no matter the specific circumstances, women were always innocent victims, no matter what they'd done, what heinous crimes they had committed. He noted, for example, that in cases of domestic dispute, here it is, personal violence on the part of the husband is severely punished. On the part of a wife, she will be let off with impunity, and he went through various other, I, I won't read them because I think I'm, I'm maybe getting a little bit behind. Uh, I won't read all of them. Um, I'll just jump. Um, yeah. He identified, he gave many examples, but then he identified two types of feminism, which I think are also relevant for our own discussions. Two types of feminism that already in 1913 had taken deep root in British society. One he called political feminism. This was a feminism claiming that against any evidence to the contrary, women and men were fundamentally equal in all things if women weren't you know, better than men. And then the other kind of feminism he called sentimental feminism. And that feminism claimed, against all evidence to the contrary, that women deserved, because of their nature and situation, special privileges, advantages, sympathy, leniency, etc., that weren't given to men. And he pointed out that though these two forms of feminism were diametrically opposed and self-contradictory, they almost always operated together in tandem in the same individual or in the same organization, and that the contradiction did not weaken feminism's power in society by one iota. He took pains to point out the depth of anti-male bigotry and gynocentric prejudice that operated even amidst otherwise judicious and impartial, fair-minded, generous, humane people. He noted, for example, and this is the, um, whoops, this large quotation here, that one of the proposals which finds most favor with the sentimental feminist is the demand that in the case of the murder by a woman of her illegitimate child, the putative father should be placed in the dock as an accessory. In other words, a man should be punished for a crime of which he is wholly innocent because the guilty person was forsooth a woman. That such a suggestion should be so much as entertained by otherwise sane persons is indeed significant of the degeneracy of mental and moral fiber induced by the feminist movement. He concluded that feminism, the idea that women had always been oppressed and that it was an urgent necessity to remedy that oppression, he concluded that feminism was a species of social hypnotism or mania, a totally irrational sentiment, uninfluenced by reason and impervious to it. He said that while feminism claimed over and over again to have anything to do with equality, this is the last quotation, 
a very little inquiry into its concrete demands suffices to show that feminism's aim so far from being equality is the very reverse, viz. to bring about with the aid of men themselves, as embodied in the forces of the state, a female ascendancy and a consolidation and consolidation and extension of already existing female privileges. Bax wasn't particularly hopeful about the possibility of reversing what he saw as the mass derangement of thought and feeling that feminism had caused. As he had found, the consistent presentation of evidence showing the falseness of feminist claims had almost no discernible effect on a true believer. And his book, The Fraud of Feminism, provides an interesting glimpse into men's legal history that turns the notion of historic male privilege fully on its head. I am often informed by friends that the tide is turning, that the end of feminism's hold on the public imagination is drawing near. And while I always hope to be wrong, I would love it if every single one of my friends could say, see, Fiamengo, you are always the naysayer. You are always the skeptic. I would love that. But I have to say, I don't really think we are at the end or even at the beginning of the end, or even as Winston Churchill said, the end of the beginning. I think we're in the grip of a very long-standing and extremely powerful social phenomenon. But I do think, that if we are to make our best case, and my, I'm causing my mic to, I, I do think, my last sentence, if, if we are going to make our best case for defeating feminism, it helps us to know something about the full extent of its fraudulent claims about the past. So that's a project that I would encourage anyone here with a heart and interest to do such work to consider taking up. Thank you very much. Well, that's quite the standing ovation. Um, I completely concur with everybody on their feet. Um, I, uh, that, wow, I, th I thought my talk for CAFE a couple of weeks ago about the Epic of Gilgamesh was, uh, was something special, but this was, this was something else. Um, we have about 10 minutes <clears throat> to uh, maybe, yeah, about 10 minutes to uh, take some questions, and uh, so uh, if you keep your questions brief, no big long preambles, try and fit as many people in, that would be great. Can I call you Janice? Of course. Janice, I don't have a question. I, I just want to say that your words today spoke so deeply to me as a man in my experience, both in society and deeply sexually, that I am inspired to become a better one and I am so grateful that you have spoken up for us. Many people were in this room when I displayed what people have called my <clears throat> passion for the need for men to stand together when the most small minority, we hope, of women come attacking us, that there are women like you who are there to be equal partners with us. And I just want to say thank you so much. You have moved me so deeply. Thank you very much. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have been able to speak with such conviction and, and knowledge if, I, if it hadn't been for the many, many men who have contacted me over the years and who have shared their, their stories, their heartbreaking stories, uh, um, and had made me aware that our movement is not only about, um, obviously, it's not only about rights and issues in the kind of general social legal sphere, but is about um, male humanity, the need to recognize that, and about the many hearts that have been broken in our era. Uh, Janice, thank you so much. Um, as you know, there are legal challenges against women's studies, and one informal argument that feminists use to defend women's studies 
is that because history is a male-dominated discipline that women's studies provides a necessary counterbalance to history departments. Now, this is not a formal legal argument that will ever be entertained in court, but it is still an informal social argument that they use. So I was wondering what is your response to that feminist argument? Well, what I've, what I've found as I have studied more and more um, about feminist claims is that every single feminist claim is false. And, uh, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> It simply never has been the case that there was any kind of desire on the part of male scholars or anybody else in society to exclude half of humanity from the historical record or from mythology or religion or the stories we tell about ourselves or, or anything. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely nonsense. And that's the thing that I find so dangerous about the uh, general historical ignorance, and I'm speaking about my own historical ignorance more so than anyone else's, is that so often someone will make a claim about th that things were thus up until, I remember once actually Karen and I were at a conference where a woman said that until the 1930s, women were not declared persons in Canada was one of the final statements made in the whole conference, and that was just so false. I mean, it's technically true, but it, it, there's a long, complicated story about why that was. It had to do with women being eligible to serve on the Senate and a Privy Council decision. It, it didn't in any way, but I mean, feminists use things like that all the time to shame men to thinking that their ancestors didn't believe women were human. It had nothing to do with that. Men always knew women were human, so yeah. It's just nonsense. Hi, so uh, pleasure to have you here. One of the things that um, I, I think a lot of us struggle with when we're dealing with this is that the current political zeitgeist uh, encapsulates basically feminist narrative, as you know. For those of us, especially if we don't have a historical backing or anything like that, in order to sift through all of the information, you know, we, we had one writer uh, go over and talk about a lot of the classics and how that did that. That stuff is great. But how, how would you recommend to us to be able to sift through? Because, you know, Lord Byron, for example, is obvious there. But, you know, because that's so shunned in the current political zeitgeist, it's very difficult for us to actually find the information because it's intentionally yes, buried. Yes, I know. Yeah. yeah. How, do, how would you recommend us to sift through and find it so that way we can actually start writing? Because the more of us that actually do this work, it's not just one person, the more of us that actually do this work and sift through it, you know, that sometimes that can be the catalyst that actually allows the change to actually happen because fighting one person, even if they are as intelligent as you and articulate as you, you know, one person can be more easily taken down. But if they are the, uh, the spark of a forest fire, if you will, now they have an entirely bigger problem that yes. they have to deal with. Mm -hmm. I think we're at that point where we're ready for that. How would you recommend for the rest of us who don't have your backing in education to be able to actually sift through the historical narrative and find this so we can actually start writing about it ourselves more effectively? It is very difficult and you know, there's no, there's no uh, easy answer for sure. I would say that if you're encountering that kind of argument that men have had power for, since the beginning of time and women never had power, even if you can find one one example that you educate yourself about and you can say well I don't know about you know all of history but I can say certainly that in the early 1800s you know this was the case or something like that often they don't know what they're talking about like brothel workers Cleopatra the lady who for the leaders in Athens during the Peloponnesian War stuff like that Yeah, I even if that. you have one example that you can bring forward that that vastly complicates the narrative right there but I would also say you know that at some level it doesn't matter and my answer would be you know that, that even if it were true that up until 1955 or whatever women had no power that would not be a reason why any kind of injustice should be perpetrated today unless you believe in basing a theory of society on collective vengeance it's an utterly right. irrelevant argument to make anyway I'm a veteran, so I'm all about the U.S. Constitution's ability to elevate the individual mm -hmm. in, in spite of the state, not Absolutely. necessarily over it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, should I take this? Uh, oh, just one second. Oh, thank you. We have time for one more quick question and one more quick answer. So um, thank you, first of all. 
uh, when, when discussing feminist history and, and deconstructing it, it's probably necessary to question their sacred texts. And Karen, you've done an excellent job of doing that with the Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca mm -hmm. Falls Convention of 1848. Indeed, but yes. of course, even before that, there's Mary Wollstonecraft's mm -hmm. Vindication of the Rights of Women. Mm -hmm. And um, how does that fit into all this? Thank you. <laughs> That's a very big question. I haven't read it for a long time. But actually, I mean, Wollstonecraft would not be uh, useful to modern feminists really very much at all because what she was talking about was educating women to be rational actors in their society. And so in many ways, you know, you could say that Mary Wollstonecraft would be appalled by the direction that modern feminism has moved. So sometimes feminist texts can actually be helpful to our side precisely because they are the few texts where the woman is arguing for genuine equality of opportunity. Thank you. All right, I'm just going to take this. Um, okay, I'm going to just hug you one more time. Um, thank you for, for that. Because that, that was like, that was just, I don't always sit in on these talks that I MC for, but years I was just glued to, to everything, every word. So, um, okay, so you guys all have like 14 minutes to relieve your bladders, have a drink, have a smoke, and uh, do all of that stuff. And then we are going to have, is it Count Dankula next? So, um, so yeah, in this room, and, uh, and, but thank you, thank you so much, Janet, Janice, because it's just like, oh my fucking, like, hug me one more time. Okay, because... I, I love literature, and I, I love what the history of literature says about men and about their inner world, and, and I think that that's actually one of the ways that we really need to go. So, All right. Go, go, go. Everybody, out. <laughs>